All right, so welcome to Math 383 Complex Analysis. This is lecture 21, I think November 3rd. And so what I want to do today is just say a very few words about the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem, uh, just so that we have some slides that just discuss the proof. The book actually does a really nice job of you know, the three steps of the proof. The heavy work is in the preamble to get us to that point. It also helps in the little contest we have to just have a quick recap of that. I will then introduce the, I saw some head nodding. I will then introduce the Riemann zeta function and we will start talking about its properties. Uh, this was not easy to do, but I actually aligned complex analysis and probability so that both classes introduced the gamma function today and talked about its properties. So that I could at least be a little bit efficient and have some of the slides doing double duty. So we're going to do a lot of techniques today. Partial summation, we'll talk about functional equations. We'll talk maybe if time permits about analytic continuation. And one of the important things to think about when you're doing research, what is the motivation? You know, it's very rare that somebody just sits down and says, you know, today I'm going to prove the product rule, and tomorrow I think I'm going to prove the quotient rule, and in the next day I think I'm going to develop this thing called the chain rule. You know, a lot of times there's a problem that you're interested in, and in the course of trying to study it, you then have to build up some tools and techniques. A lot of complex analysis was built by people trying to understand how many primes there are up to a given height. And that was the inspiration for a lot of the results, you know, far more than we're going to be able to cover in just a one semester class. But if you actually look at the history of the subject, this was the motivating problem. Just like for physics, a lot of physics was motivated by trying to understand the orbits of planets. So it's interesting to look at what was behind the subject. You might think that complex analysis is a little bit strange to use to understand primes. Why might complex analysis be a strange tool to use to study primes? Yep, primes are integers. And you know, I forget who said it, uh, maybe somebody here remembers. Oftentimes the shortest path to a proof about integers or real numbers is through the complex plane. And the reason is it's a really good detour because complex analysis has a truly powerful machine of right. So you know, again, just very briefly, we had Montel's theorem, which gave us you know, some analysis conditions. And in the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem, that if you have a proper simply connected subset that's open, that's not all C, uh, you can set it up so that it's in some point Z naught to zero. The first derivative is going to be greater than there. And then there will be an exists, a unique map that has these properties, because I've now specified how it maps one point, and I've specified the sign of the derivative. And the proof was broken up into three steps. The first step was you could use the log of the map, which exists because it is simply connected and not all of C, to say, look, I have a conformal isomorphism, a conformal map between my omega and a subset of the unit disk. So without loss of generality, I might as well assume that omega is a subset of the unit disk. So that was step one. Step two was we used Montel to get a map with maximal derivative at the origin. And then step three, we showed that it was conformal. And if it's not conformal, we could have actually constructed a new map that was a little bit better. So again, I'm not going to say you know, too much about this. Uh, you know, you know, step two, you know, here's the details straight from the book. You know, it's very nice and readable. We talked a little bit about why the derivative may not be able to be larger than one. We've talked about the real analog of this. And this is where we're using Montel. We're applying it not to the function f n, but to its derivatives. And then step three was we were demonstrating that it was a conformal map. And this was you know, almost like divine inspiration looking at a square root function. And because of our assumptions about omega, we actually know that such a function exists. And the book has a very nice remark at the end. You know, where did we actually use the fact that uh, we had simple connectivity? And you know, we used it when we were defining the square root. We used it when we were defining the logarithm. It's always worth asking, do I really need these assumptions, or are they just making things easier? When we did the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we didn't need to assume that the first derivative was bounded or even that the first derivative existed. But boy, it made things a lot easier. You know, we then didn't have to deal with uniform continuity. We didn't have to deal with open covers and finite subcovers and all the results from analysis, but it made the result more restrictive. And so it's better to remove those restrictions if possible. So you always want to know when does the flavor fundamentally change versus it's just a little bit of a convenience. All right, so now partial summation. 
So when you look at the partial summation, it's the sum of a and vn, say we have little n going from m to n, it's equal to capital A n B n minus a capital A m minus one B m and then a sum involving a little n B n minus B n plus one. And here um, we are defining a um, n to be the sum of let's say a m m goes from big M to N. So we're just summing up to a certain point. It's often convenient to write it in the second form. We have some nice function H and we will evaluate H a sequence of integers. And if H is differentiable, we can replace the sum of A N H of N with you know, the value A of X, H of X minus the integral from one to X of A of U, H prime of U to U. I'm not going to go through the proof. It's a good exercise. Yes. Oh. Well, no, because capital A is summing just up to just the integers. So if I if I increase x by you know a half above an integer, I don't change the value of a of x. So you could, if you want, almost evaluate just at the floor. So I'm not going to go through the proof. It's a good exercise for you to try to prove this. It's really an exercise in uh, bookkeeping. How many of you did this in a real analysis class? Okay. This is often covered in real analysis classes. What does this look like? Where have you seen something like this before? Yeah, integration by parts. So looks like integration by parts. And if I give you the function uv, its derivative is u v prime plus sorry, we have it? u prime b plus uv prime. So what this is basically telling us is if I have the integral of uv prime, this is equal to the integral of u v prime minus the integral of u prime v. And this becomes, you know, the integral of u dv is u v at the boundary points minus the integral of v du. So really, integration by parts is just rewriting the product rule. And it's saying, look, every time I have a derivative rule, it gives me an integration rule. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Okay, the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. The product rule is a little bit harder to use. You know, the derivative of a product is not the product of the derivatives. That means the integral of a product is not going to be the product of the integrals. This is the formulation that comes up. What's nice about this is that frequently the function a of x is well understood. And by that, I mean, we often can figure out what is the main term of a of x. And maybe the main term might be nice and linear in x, but there might be fluctuations that are small, maybe of size square root of x. And this essentially smooths things out. So if you have a discrete sum, it's a real pain to deal with. But if I can smooth it out and say, well, look, on average, it's growing like this. Let me try to replace it with its average behavior. You know, let me replace it with the main term. Try to analyze the main term. If you can't even understand what's going on at the main term, you really have no hope of understanding the general problem. So as a rule of thumb, try to build intuition. Say, oh, let's say things are nice. You know, let's say the primes are perfectly spaced. You know, maybe the nth prime is exactly log n. And see if I can you know, make any results like that. Now, if the primes were perfectly spaced, you know, where the distance from one prime to the next was log n, the correct average spacing, what would you immediately lose? So the nth prime is log n. What would you lose? What theorem that we believe is true, but no one has proven? Nope. We even hypothesis can still hold. You might still be able to prove that, but there is a formula involving two primes that we would lose. If the primes, 
are completely regularly spaced with the nth prime say exactly at log n. We would lose the twin prime, right? The twin prime conjecture says that there are infinitely many primes that differ by two. And there was remarkable progress in the last decade where we now know that there is a finite number. I think it's been worked on to be under a thousand now, where we know that there are infinitely many primes whose difference is at most a thousand. You would lose a theorem like that if the primes were perfectly spaced, you know, growing at the average rate. And so the reason is, you know, these are really subtle questions. If the, the average spacing between primes of size x, we'll see that it is about log x. And so if you want to talk about a gap of size 2, 2 divided by log x, that's essentially 0. And so you're looking at something that's essentially 0 relative to the average spacing. Now, the number of primes up to x, the prime number theorem, it says it's about x over log x. We believe that the number of twin primes is order of magnitude x over log squared of x. You might not think that log is an, that big of a deal that there's an extra log x in the denominator, but it means, you know, in the limit, we think 0% of numbers are twin primes. So we're talking about the behavior of a very thin sequence. So you can often modify your sequences and, you know, adjust things to either have things happen or not happen. All right. So one of the tools we're going to need is the gamma function. So because this is complex and not probability, I can assume people here have seen complex numbers. And so we might as well study the gamma function as a function of a complex S and not just, you know, S being real. And so it's defined as the integral of e to the negative x, x to the s minus 1 dx. And as soon as you see this, you should start cursing who the hell defined it as s minus 1 as the power of x. You know, why, why wouldn't you have gamma of s be x to the s? Well, the reason is I could actually rewrite this as x to the s and then dx over x. And the nice thing about dx over x is if I rescale x by a constant, then dx over x is invariant. If I rescale it by a factor of 5, dx over x changes by 5 over 5, or it doesn't change at all. So there's some advanced theory here about what transforms nicely, and that's why you want to write it like this. There are some places where instead of using gamma of s, they use g of s, which has an x to the s. Why do you think they might use the letter g? Yeah, gamma, right? So the function is related, but it's just, it's a simple shift. Not a big deal. Okay. Whenever you see a definition, you should at least make sure that it exists. So we are defining this as an integral. So we want to make sure that the integral exists. Well, notice e to the minus x decays exponentially fast at infinity x to the s minus 1 grows polynomially. So we're OK as x goes to infinity. So in terms of convergence, I don't worry about will this converge as x goes to infinity. Near the origin, however, that's a different story. So near x equals 0, approximately what is e to the negative x? one. And then x to the s minus one is integrable if you know, the real part of s minus one is greater than zero. I'm oh, sorry, um, greater than negative one. Because if I have one over x, if I try to integrate, you know, one over x from say epsilon to one, and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. This is the natural log of x, one and epsilon, take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. The natural log of one is zero. So this is going to just be the limit as epsilon goes to zero, the natural log of epsilon. And that's going to go to, oops, with a negative sign. And that's going to just go to infinity. So if I have one over x, it's not going to be integrable. If I have one over x squared or anything you know, worse, it's not going to be integrable. So I need to make sure that I have the power of x is greater than negative one so that when I integrate, it's going to be well behaved. And so now, if the real part of s minus one is greater than zero, 
is greater than negative one, then the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral from epsilon to one of x to the s minus one dx is going to be x to the s over s one and epsilon, take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and this is finite. Because now we have x to a positive real time. I'm not going to be having one over x, which would blow up as x goes to zero. So the gamma function is nice and well defined. Okay, what is gamma of one? That's just the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x dx. This is the easiest value to look at. What do we get? One. All right, building on this success, what's the next value you'd want to evaluate gamma of f? Two. All right, so we have gamma of two, we would have the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x, x dx. How would we evaluate this integral? So how would you evaluate this integral? Yeah, integration by parts. So integration by parts, and you get one. Ah, whenever you put in an integer, you always get one. Who believes this? All right. Let's calculate gamma of three. So the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x, x squared dx. How would we evaluate this? Integration by parts again. All right, so it's two. Oh, okay, so it's not always one. It's one, one, two. It's the Fibonacci numbers. All right, let's go one further. Integrate from zero to infinity, e to the negative x, x cubed dx, and you get six. How should I view these numbers? Factorials. So this is really zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial. And we can see that the gamma function is going to be generalizing the factorial function. And so it actually satisfies a functional equation. So what this tells us is that if we know the behavior of the gamma function in a region, in a strip of width one, we can actually extend it to be defined everywhere. And how do you think you prove this? Induction. Well, that's what we want to get at. So what do you think we would use? So if we wanted to try to do induction, that only works if S goes to integer values. We could try to use accumulation. Yeah, it's integration by parts, right? We were calculating all of these ones over here by integrating by parts. Let's just try to do integration by parts. So we have gamma of s plus one is equal to the integral from zero to infinity e to the negative x, x to the s plus one minus one dx. So I need u, dv, du, and v. And this will be uv at zero infinity minus the integral from zero to infinity of v du. So let's take u, well, x to the s plus one minus one, x to the s. This becomes s, x to the s minus one dx, dv is e to the negative x, v is negative e to the minus x. And if you look at uv, when I evaluate things at infinity, e to the negative x kills and I get zero. When I evaluate things at zero, e to the negative x is fine, it's just one, but I have an x to the, zero, x to the s, which is just going to be zero. So the boundary term vanishes, and we get gamma of s plus one is equal to s times the integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative x, x to the s minus one dx. I've just pulled the s outside, and I have uh, noticed that the minus and the minus reinforce and become a positive. Oh, well, that's just the definition of the gamma function. That's just gamma of s. And so the proof is just a straightforward integration by parts. And so now, if we know the gamma function 
in a strip of width one, we can then just use this to define it everywhere. So gamma of S, yes. Yes, as long as we stay away from the negative integers. At the negative integers, it has a pole and it goes up. Right? And so if you take S equals zero, it blows up. And so as you try to push that forward or backwards to the negative number, it's going to blow up at all the negative integers. And this is actually going to lead to the famous Riemann zeta function having trivial zeros at the negative even integers. So the gamma function is related to the factorial function by gamma of n plus one is just n factorial. So it is a way to extend. So if you ever wanted to know how many ways are there to order three people, but order matters, the answer is six, right? What if you wanted to order you know, five and a third people when order matters? We now have a way to answer that question. It's not entirely clear what that means, but we have a way. Humans at the next slide. Yes. Uh, if anybody is interested, I can share a bunch of proofs of this. This is a beautiful formula for the gamma function. Gamma of s times gamma of one minus s is pi over sine of pi s. So this is a fun thing to try to prove if you haven't seen the proof before. In particular, the best value to take for s is one half. Why is that the best value to take in this formula? Okay, one is sine equals one. Yeah, on the, on the left hand side, you get one term squared. If I take, say, s equals one fourth, I would have gamma of one fourth times gamma of three fourths. It doesn't allow me to solve anything. But if I happen to take s equals one half, I get gamma of one half squared is just pi over one. Okay, which means gamma of one half is the square root of pi. Who here has taken statistics? Maybe I should pause. Uh, we are about to experience technical difficulty. Okay, so for those of you who have taken statistics, why am I excited about gamma of one half equals square root of pi? Yes. So now, which distribution do you think from statistics do you think it would be related to? If you had to choose one distribution. Sorry? I'm only, okay, come on. I'm only giving you one distribution to choose in statistics. If you could only have one distribution in statistics, the Gaussian, right? So we're at least getting Gauss into the lecture. So Gauss is on the scoreboard, okay? You should not go this deep in a math class without seeing Gauss's name. Right? So the Gaussian is one of a square. Wow, I somehow went to that from Fred. Okay, wish I knew how I had done that. Uh, e to the negative x squared over 2. This is the standard normal. It turns out the moments of the Gaussian are related to the gamma fraction. And if you think about it, you, know, you have an e to the negative x squared. If you do a change of variables, you know, the 2 mth moment is twice the integral from 0 to infinity, x to the 2m, 1 over square root of 2 pi, e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. Why am I not looking at the odd moments of the standard number? Yeah, the odd moments are 0. You know, it's an odd function over a symmetric region, easy convergence. So the odd moments aren't worth looking at. If I change variables, if I let u equal x squared over 2, then this is going to become some type of integral from 0 to infinity. I'll have some factors over here. And then I'll have something like e to the minus u, and then u to some power du. And that looks like a gamma function. And that's where the square root of pi comes from in the normalization of the standard norm. It actually comes from the gamma function. That's a nice exercise. You can figure out precisely what the moments of the Gaussians are in terms of uh, the factorials. It turns out it's 2m minus 1 double factorial 
the double factorial does not mean the factorial of the factorial. It does not mean that I'm excited that the answer is two and minus one factorial. It means every other term. So double factorial of five would be five times three times one. Okay. So we have finally reached the Riemann zeta function. Yeah. One of the most important functions in all of mathematics. And so it is defined initially for real part of S greater than one as the sum of one over n to the s, or as the product over primes of one minus one over p to the s and s. So we have to prove this equivalence. So the proof uses two things. The first is the geometric series. If I give you one over one minus x, one minus x inverse, that's one plus x plus x squared plus dot dot dot. The other is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, any n is a unique product of primes in increasing order. N equals, you know, P1 to the R1. Uh, let's see, instead of R1, we'll do K1, PK. No, we'll, we'll do R. PK to the RK. What is a prime number? Okay, so one possibility is an integer that's only divisible by one and itself. And it's not one. Your definition technically allows one to be a prime number. This would be a catastrophe. Not as bad as a baseball game ending in a tie, which required the commission of baseball to intervene and say this will never happen again. Why would it be bad if one were a prime? You would lose unique factorization. I could multiply by one to the 2021, one to the 1701, one to the 24601. I would lose unique factorization. So this is why we do not want one to be a prime, is we want to maintain unique factorization. So if we use unique factorization, it's not a bad exercise to show using the geometric series formula that we can expand things up. And you can do it you know, term by term by term. So I strongly urge you try to do this calculation if you have trouble, uh, let me know. Or if you want me to do it in class, email me and I will I'll just put it in the next lecture of just you know, going through and doing this rigorously. It's a really good exercise to show. I need two volunteers. Okay, okay. Uh, whose hand was up first? I think your hand was up slightly first. Do you want to be integers or primes? Okay. Give me, start rattling off integers after 2021. No, no, in consecutive order. Oh, okay. Okay, you, you've convinced me that you can keep doing this as long as needed. I, you, you unfortunately have primes. So please start rattling off primes starting at 2021. So this is where somebody quickly goes to Mathematica to Wolf Mouth and starts feeding you lists or whatnot, right? Do we agree that it is, we don't know a good way to rattle off primes? There really is not that much mystery in the distribution of integers. In fact, uh, there is a famous form, I think it goes all the way back to Euclid for the nth integer. Is anybody familiar with this formula? F of n equals n, right? And in fact, we even know the distribution of spacings between consecutive integers. It's always one. So the idea is there is no mystery in the distribution of the integers. And the zeta function is defined as a sum over integers. Maybe we can use knowledge of the integers because it's now connected to this product over primes to get information about the primes. So that is the hope. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be developing tools and complex analysis. Why do we care so much about primes? They're cool. Uh, I remember one of my uh, favorite students 
who was giving a talk and he gave three reasons of motivation. And the third was my professor likes it. It's not a bad, but what makes the prime so cool? Why do we care so much about primes? I mean, I don't know. So good, because any number can be written uniquely as a product of times. In some sense, you have almost like an infinite dimensional basis, and any number can be written in terms of these basis elements. Any number has a factorization as a product of times uniquely if we write them in increasing order. These are the building blocks of numbers. So if we can understand primes, that seems like a good thing to be studying. That seems like a good thing to do. And so the hope is that we can find some way to extract information from the series. Okay. So it turns out, and we'll talk about this later, the zeta function satisfies a functional equation. So if you put in a factor of pi and if you put in a gamma function, it makes it a little bit nicer. And we call this the completed zeta function and its value at s equals its value at one minus s. And it is conjectured that all the non-trivial zeros of this function have real part one half. Uh, it's zeros, it does have zeros at the negative even numbers. If you can prove this, uh, you will get a A plus in this class. You will get out of your colloquial requirement. Uh, not every professor, I think, in the department agrees that if you give a five minute proof of the Riemann hypothesis, that you've satisfied the colloquial requirement. Colloquial requirement is supposed to be a 30 minute presentation. There's enough of us, though, that would support you if you give a five minute proof of the Riemann hypothesis, that I think we can make it work. You will get a PhD from your school of choice with a few honorary degrees probably thrown in. You will get a million dollars. So a lot of incentive. You are allowed to use the web. You can work together. You know, the deal, as many of you get involved, that's fine. Happy to spread the wealth. Yes. So if, if you look at this new function, it's related to the zeta function. It's the zeta function times a well understood beast, you know, gamma function and a power of pi. And it just turns out that this function equals its value at one minus s. So th this is the functional equation. So if I understand uh, C of s when the real part of s is greater than a half, I now immediately know it when the real part of s is less than a half. And so the functional equation allows you to pass from knowing it in one regime to knowing it in another. Interestingly, the million dollar prize, I think the way it's written, does not exist for a disproof of the Riemann hypothesis. I think only you only get the money if you prove the Riemann hypothesis. We know a huge number of zeros of the Riemann zeta function uh, lie on the critical line. Your real part of S equals one half. There's been a lot of work on it, but it is still open that all the non-trivial zeros have real part one half. There are some results that bound how many zeros you can have off the line up to a given height. One of my advisors, Henry Kavanias, uh, jokingly called it as trying to get better and better upper bounds for the cardinality of the MP set. You know, I can prove the MP set has at least, I'm sorry, has at most this many elements. These are still useful. Even if you can't prove the Riemann hypothesis, if you can prove something about how many exceptions there are to it, that is still extremely valuable. Later in the semester, I may give a talk about some connections between number theory, random matrix theory, and nuclear physics. And it turns out that the spacings between zeros of the Riemann zeta function look like the spacings between eigenvalues of certain families of complex matrices. And this was empirically discovered in the 1970s, and it has led to a remarkable interplay between mathematical physics <laughs> and number theory. And so just as an example, uh, the plot over here is looking at 70 million consecutive zeros and their spacings, starting at the 10 to the 20th zero. Beautiful calculation by Andrew Lisko. And the solid line is what you get in something called random matrix theory, looking at the spacings between eigenvalues of complex matrices. And it's remarkable seeing such similar behavior in two very different systems, or three systems if you throw in nuclear physics. So what I want to do is I want to motivate a little bit of you know, the big results we're going to prove. I need some results from linear algebra. And so this is, I know a prerequisite for the course. So I know everyone has taken linear algebra. So one of the things we have in linear algebra is the trace of A is the sum K goes from one to N of A, K, K. And I'm trying to be very careful. Normally I would say I goes from one to N, but as this is a complex analysis class, you should never use I as an index of summation. And it turns out the theorem 
is the trace of A is the sum of the eigenvalues of A. How many people have seen this theorem before? And there's another theorem involving the product of the eigenvalues and the determinant of the matrix. When you first see this, you know, okay, who cares? It turns out this is an extremely important formula, one of the most important formulas in linear algebra, at least if you want to do random matrix theory, which is a great way to model many different systems. And the reason it's so useful is the eigenvalues of your system basically describe what the hell is going on. But eigenvalues, they're hard to find. How would you actually find the eigenvalue? So how would you find eigenvalues of the matrix? So you, you want AV equals lambda V. Find lambda by what? So put a triangle form. And so this is essentially solving things like the determinant of A minus lambda I equals zero, triangle form, calculations like this. These are very delicate calculations to do. You know, if you have large matrices. Theoretically, there's no problem, but typically we know information about the entries of the matrix. And this passes from, passes from knowledge of matrix elements to the eigenvalues. Does that seem like anything we talked about earlier today? passing from knowledge of the matrix elements to eigenvalues. Where do we see something similar about trying to pass? Yeah, very similar to going from knowledge of integers to knowledge of primes. And so the proof, if A is diagonalizable, it's trivial. Not every matrix is diagonalizable, but every matrix can be put into upper triangular form. And so we can write A as S T S inverse T upper triangular. And then what is the trace of S T S inverse? No, the trace of a product is not the product of the traces. But trace has this nice cyclic property. The trace of ABC is the same as the trace of BCA. So this is the same as the trace of T S inverse S, which is just the trace of T. And this over here is the trace of A. And so this is a sketch of the proof. You know, I strongly urge you to try to prove this. You know, here's a couple of hints. And the whole point is this allows us to move from knowledge of one area to knowledge of another. And that's gonna be a big theme in the next few weeks. All right, so let me show you how this would occur in complex analysis. Why do you think I'm looking at zeta prime over zeta? Okay, but why in complex analysis would I be looking at a zeta prime over zeta? Yeah, it's useful for finding zeros and poles. You know, in complex analysis, you should have a couple of Pavlovian responses. Whenever you see a complex function, what should you want to do to it? You want to take its logarithmic derivative and do some type of contour integral. Right? This should be a Pavlovian response. Now, I can write zeta as either a sum or a product. Which do you think is going to be better here, a sum or a product? Product, why? I'm sorry? Yeah, a, a, a log of sums is going to be horrible, but a log of a product is the sum of the logs. So I definitely want to write my function as, you know, zeta function as product over prime. Well, the derivative of the log of the product is going to be the sum of the derivatives of the logs. So I take the derivative, and then I use the geometric series to expand the one minus p to the minus s in the denominator. And when I expand it, you know, the first term is going to give me uh, one, and I have a p to the minus s in the numerator, so I get a p to the s in the denominator. 
And then it turns out when you look at everything else, it turns out, you know, again, we'll do this in more detail later, it doesn't really contribute that much. It's easy to understand. And now what we do is we do a contour integral and we're going to integrate against X to the S over S. And so when we do the contour integral, every time we have a zero or pole of the zeta function, we get a contribution. Now, if we have a pole, the contribution is going to be negative one, and it'll be the function x to the s over s at the pole. It turns out the zeta function has a pole at s equals one. So we're going to get negative and negative is going to be a positive. We're going to get x to the one over one. And then all the other zeros will give us a negative x to the rho over rho. And so if the Riemann hypothesis is true, and we're going to talk about this in much greater detail, this is an overview of what we're going to be discussing. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, we have the sum on the left is going to be x minus the sum of x to the rho over rho. And if the Riemann hypothesis is true, all the real parts of the rho is one half. So those terms would be much smaller than the main term. On the right hand side, it turns out that this is one if p is less than x, zero if p is greater than x. And what do you think it is if p equals x? Have a guess. It's one if p is less than x, zero if p is greater than x. One half. So this is a beautiful integral. Again, I'm being cavalier. I'm not showing all the bounds of integration and everything. This is meant to just give you a high level overview of what we're going to be doing over the next few, uh, few lectures. This function detects whether or not p is less than equal to x. Notice it counts times with a log p weight. So this is a small amount of discrimination. The log function does not change that rapidly, but it makes things a lot easier. And then we use those partial summation formulas I talked about at the beginning of the lecture to remove those log p weights. You know, if you want to know how many primes there are up to x, that's a little bit different than knowing how many weighted primes are there up to x. You want to remove those weights. But the log p weights in number theory come from the Riemann zeta function. They come from the product. All right, so um, based on how much time is left, I think what I will do is just add um, so special value proofs. So we have zeta of s is the sum and goes from one to infinity of one over n to the s. And it's the same as the product of a p prime one minus one over p to the s inverse. What's the limit as s goes to one from above of zeta of s? What is that sum equal? Infinity, what, what series is it? Harmonic. This is basically the sum of one over n. It's the harmonic divergence. Therefore, infinitely many primes tells the product is finite. So because we know the harmonic series diverges, we know there must be infinitely many primes. And in fact, if I had a little bit more time today, we'll probably do it next time. You could even estimate a little bit how many primes must there be up to x because we know how rapidly the harmonic series diverges. We know the sum and less equal to x of one over n is approximately the log of x. So you could even use that to estimate approximately how many primes there are. The other one which I'll mention is here's a beautiful result. Zeta of two is the sum of one over n squared. This is the same as the product of the primes of one minus one over p squared inverse. Does anybody know what zeta of two equals? Pi squared over six. What kind of number is pi squared over six? Irrational. Therefore, infinitely many primes else pi squared over six would be rational. So if there were only finitely many primes, the product would be a finite product. 
So the worst result I ever proved in my life was I was wondering, could you make an explicit result from this? This tells us that there are infinitely many primes, but it doesn't seem to give any count as to how many primes are there up to x. I can take the first proof and get an explicit count. We'll do Euclid's proof next time I can get an explicit count. So Euclid proves that there's at least log log x primes up to x. By using this, I was able to prove that there's at least log 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 x primes up to x. So this seems bad because it's worse than Euclid. It's even worse than that. In my proof, one of the results I use is the irrationality exponent of pi squared. How irrational is it? Do you know what is used in the proof of the irrationality exponent of pi squared? The prime number theorem, that the number of primes up to x is x over log x. So by assuming that the number of primes up to x is x over log x, I can prove that there's at least log 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 x primes up to x. So I was able to fix this a little bit later. I will send an email on that. So if you want to grab some candy on the way out, please do so.